Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Please, as ever, subscribe and go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list. We have an academy that we have there and you can sign up for a 14 day free trial and try it out. There's a whole bunch of sessions you can download. We're doing mixed critiques. There's forums, there's all kinds of fun stuff. So please, if you can, go and try out the uh, free trial. Okay, so today we're gonna do another mix breakdown. And the mix breakdown we're gonna do is with a keyboard player that I work a lot with called Steve Magora. Now, you may know that name because Steve is the keyboard player in Robert John and the Wreck, which is a band we've also showcased here. And uh, he's a very talented musician to say the least. Insanely talented. So he does all the backgrounds in Robert John and the Wreck and he plays all the keys and of course he's a co-writer. So this is uh, gonna be a song, uh, When I Get You Alone, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a racy song, shall we say, it's from his solo album. So this is something um, I produced here at Spitfire and we also did some overdubs and, and uh, tracking and hybrid. The band is based in Orange County, so hybrid is like their local studio. So anyway, this is a track that was mainly done here and we'll go through it and we'll talk about it and uh, describe the recording process as well as the mixing process because I know a lot of you have been asking how we recorded. So we'll include that as much as we can with the mix. Okay, so let's check the song out. So if you've listened to the Robert John on the Wreck stuff, you'll know that their aesthetic, their sound, their, their, their whole thing is about set the 70s, about classic rock from the 70s. You know, if you listen to Robert John the Wreck, you'll think of, you know, Allman Brothers, um, you know, anything that has harmony and great melody and stuff like that, which is obviously synonymous with great 70s bands. Steve, although this isn't a rock project as such, it has that same feel. There's a lot of kind of Herbie Hancock piano playing and stuff in it. Let's give it a listen and I'll show you what I mean. So it's got a really cool 70s kind of vibe. The drums were done here in this room. As ever, we'll link to the SoundCloud where you can hear the song. Go below to hear it in its entirety. So the drums were done here at Spitfire. And if you've watched other videos, my room is really small. It's, uh, you know, it's less than, it's less, it's about half the size of a garage, it's tiny. So it's, it's good to know because it means you can record drums in small environments. Here is uh, the kick, the overheads with a hat. And uh, live snare. So. Literally, kick, one kick drum mic with the kick mic on the front of the head. 57 top and bottom on the snare. A um, Lewitt 140, LCT 140 on the hi-hat and a pair of 340s on the overheads. Uh, the toms, very ridiculously expensively mic just because we had a pair of C12As, which is insane. Um, I've also done toms millions of times with 57s and 421s. Most of the time, if I'm in a bigger studio, I use 421s. There's only one mic on the top of both these toms. So these are the live drum sounds. So let's go somewhere where you can hear all the instruments, all the drums. So that is all the live drums. Once again, it's the Lewitt, it's a Lewitt kick drum mic, 57 top and bottom, Lewitt 340s for overheads, um, a Lewitt 140 on the hi-hat, which is a very inexpensive condenser, um, and then the C12As on the toms, which is, you know, ridiculously expensive on the toms, I'll be honest. Um, but it's what we had a pair of, and they sounded great. Um, in a lot of studios, when I was working with uh, Dave Sardi, um, he would always use 414s on toms. So that's our basic live drum sound. Now, as you know, it's a small drum kit in a small room. So to get a bigger drum sound here, I've got my three addictive kicks here. Take them out. Back in. 
So they're giving a lot more definition. They're really, really useful for doing that. If you go to the, uh, um, the addictive Melodyne tutorial I did, where you see me using Melodyne to create the MIDI, I personally like doing it that way. Now, it's not the fastest. I had a few people comment going, oh, you can do it quicker in this program and that program. The consensus, correct me if I'm wrong, but the consensus I've been getting from people, especially in, in, in the Academy forum, is that the MIDI is definitely best done in Melodyne. That's just what I've been hearing. Um, I personally find the MIDI in Melodyne is very, very accurate. It's really, really good. As you can see, the phase is great between these kicks. It's really good. You know, that's a really, that as far as, um, you know, automatically doing it, that's pretty darn accurate. And as you can see, it sounds pretty fat. Now, I've also created grace notes on the snare, as well as snare hits, again, using me uh, Melodyne to create the MIDI. So without the snare, without, with, so it's pretty subtle. They're not that loud. If you see, I've got it like down at minus 28. So when a lot of people ask me what's going on, it's like I, I tend to, um, you know, use, when I've got a small drum set like this in a small room, I've either got to um, build a smaller track around it or I've got to add to the drum sounds a little bit to get the track, you know, to get the drums to compete with a little bit more instruments. It's kind of a catch-22. It really depends on what your ultimate gain is. I think a small drum kit like that, when I've done it on Trevor Hall's record, if you, we did a breakdown of one of, um, um, one of Trevor's songs, um, which is in an earlier video, and hopefully there'll be an annotated link to that as I speak to it, speak about it. And you'll notice I didn't do really anything to those drums beyond um, maybe putting themselves against each other, like doing some parallel compression. But when a track like this, even though it's not massively dense, it's got a little bit of the drum samples around it to kind of give it some energy. Now this is a big secret weapon of mine. This is the D28. I believe this is in the sample package. So if you go to the website and sign up for, for free, you'll get it. But here's the D28. At without it. Back in. It's pretty special. Um, you see what I've done here? I've pitched it down in the octave. So here's the, well, let's go, let's listen to, here's the regular one. So I've taken it down a little bit more. So it's just a little lower. So what I did is I took the actual sample itself and then pitched it down and it just made it just a little bit fatter. And together, now put in the live snare. Take it out. Live snare. So it's really, it's really doing a great job on the, uh, you know, enhancing the live drums because it's matching the pitch close enough so it doesn't sound like some alien drum samples in there. So there's all the drums together. Now, if you listen closely, you'll notice something else that's going on in the drums. We've got some kick room here which is just like a little three-quarter of a second reverb. On the snare. We've got a verb down here. We've gated it just to clean it up a little bit because we are using a live snare. So we're just cleaning up the center of the verb. Not after the verb, so we're not doing a we're not doing a Hugh Page and Phil Collins thing. We're just cleaning up what's going to the reverb. So you've got a gate here. And that's just cleaning up that snare drum that's triggering the verb. 
If you want to reverse the gate and put it after the reverb, you can get for that total Phil Collins, very controlled contained snare reverb, but that's not what we're doing. And then we're using our old favorite MV2, which we do like a lot. It's a great, we're using it to really compress that verb and make it feel very even. Without, with, just enough to just add some ambience to it. Again, this is a dryish 70s track, but it's not so dry that it's dead and sounds like a dance track. It's, it's just like a, in a small room. I, you've heard me say this before, but my old drum room that I used to have was bigger and it had about a three quarter of a second decay. So my ears like a three quarter second decay. Does that, is that the best thing? It really depends. On this track, it's great, but it's not universal. And we've got a fake room down here. And the fake room, again, is a reverb set to 0.7, almost the same. Take it out. Making quite a big difference. It's on all of the kit. See? So you can see what we're doing. We've got the live drum kit, which sounds good probably a little small for what we need, and then we're just adding some samples up gen gently underneath, especially on the snare. And then when we did take that D28, that snare sample that I created, we just dropped it, doubled it, and then dropped one of them down an octave to just give it some bottom end. So some little manipulation. The top one gave us a little, the, the, the higher D28 gave us a bit more of the bottom snare, and then bringing it down kind of gave us a bit more body. Okay, so let's bring in the bass. Great groove. Now, we've got our usual tricks on the bass here. As you know, I love multiband compression. Personally, it's between, always between the Wave C4 or the Mac DSP MC series. I like them both. Sometimes I'll use both together. And what I've done here, let's uh, just go into bass for a second, is this, a solo it. So I'm soloing there, you see, this is all bypassed above here, so it's not compressing anything above 250. So it's aggressively compressing 250 hertz and below. And the reason why I do that is it takes all of the low information, like some frequencies here and here and all these different dynamics, and then squashes them so they're always consistently playing low end. And the beauty of that is, is when the bass player goes high, it still has the warmth and the bottom end. One thing I'll notice with basses is you end up riding them quite crazily with volume automation because certain notes get lost. Now, if you use a multiband, you'll keep the warmth on the bottom end and you'll find when you want that bass to be sitting, hitting around, you know, 0 dB on your meters, it will stay there a lot more evenly using this. Look at the meter here. Even though it's only got information from 250 and below, it's pretty even the whole time. Even that, even that high stuff. That's super low there. So it's a great tool. I really like it a lot. Um, if I only had one plug in on bass, that would be my favorite one to use. So now let's take it out of solo and you hear the whole thing together. So now I know all the personalities back, but all that top end's not being compressed. And also, when I compress it, I then turn it up. So I'm not just compressing, pushing everything down. I'm taking all these different low frequencies that are going on down here, compressing them all together so they're all at a similar volume, and then turning it up so it's back at 0 dB. So here, if I go back to my C4 for a second, watch it again. See what it's doing? If you look at here, it's keeping it all in the same area. So it's consistently always printing 250 and below, nice and evenly. It's a really nice trick. I can't remember who I borrowed it from or stole it from. Maybe I made it up, but I don't think so. I'm, so, I'm sure somebody smarter than me showed me that. But it's a great trick. Okay, um, on the guitars. Mm -hmm. 
Not a lot going on the guitars, they're recorded the way I wanted to. This is, you know, if you've been watching, progressively watching my videos, you'll know about four or five months ago I reviewed this, like the month after it came out. I'm not sponsored by them, I bought the plugin, it's only $27. Um, it's pretty much with, you know, the familiar plugins like the Mac DSP that I love, this is pretty much my new favorite. It's, listen to what it's doing on this one guitar. See that warmth it brought back in? So again, if you look over here, there's this side chain function. So what that's doing is it's letting these frequencies, 250 hertz and below, pass through without being compressed. It's actually set to 251. Um, 251, that's a nice number for, for us gear geeks. So everything below 251 hertz is passing through and then it's compressing everything above that. So it's evening out the high end and letting the low end breathe and be natural. And then this is my favorite control ever on any plugin at the moment, is the drive function is so smooth and it, it evenly distorts from lows to highs. Once again, I'm not endorsed by these guys, it's just a really good plugin, um, especially at 27 bucks. And again, and it's three different compressors in one. So we've doubled up the uh, guitars, both are being compressed the same way. One's panned, 50%, the other one 100%, but on this one, we've got a little delay. So it's creating a very, very close slap. You see it's at 1 64th, the two together. Just give us some width when it's a single guitar. I can't remember if that's me playing guitar or not. I think it might be. So here we have vocal, bass and drums, the guitar. Now sax comes in. So that's sax. It's a live saxophone, not a key sax. Not a huge amount going directly on the track. A little bit of low mid boost. A little bit of high boost at 9K, just some air. Just that the air above and then sometimes on saxophones I might go in I, I'm not doing it here but I might go into 2k and pull some of that out that can get really 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 brash in brass if you have a lot of brass instruments together sometimes the 2k area is just like takes your head off um, but that's going into really just compression here's the waves 1176 the CLA one not really doing anything on that, but if we go to the louder portion here, tiny amount, less than a dB most of the time. There's a harmony part to it. Even with those two together, it's still just about a dB. I've got an L1 across it to even it out. And then our old friend here, the twin tube processor, just to give it a little bit of grit. Without. With. So it just dirties it up a little bit. You'll notice there's a lot of that stuff going on in modern music and modern mixes. People are using more and more um, saturation plugins because we're realizing with the amount of analog gear that out, out there, a lot of it was just things kind of See, clipping's the wrong word. To me, clipping, clipping is very negative. Distorting and adding second and third harmonics from um, analog equipment, whether it be tubes is a big deal, obviously, adding second and third harmonics and other things. Transformers, adding a lot of low-end, discrete, hand-wired electronics. I'm not an audiophile, I'm not an expert, but most guys that are really obsessed with that stuff will claim that discrete electronics also sounds better than chip-based stuff. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an expert. My SSL that we're monitoring through at the moment is chip-based and people love that too. So there's lots of different discussions you can have there, but one thing I will say is that um, a little bit of distortion goes a long way. That's what we're doing on the 
on the sax here, just a little bit, and what we did on those with the clang helm, that's what we did on the guitars there. So next up, of course, and probably most importantly, is the vocal. The vocal is exactly my normal chain. You can see I've done some volume rides here. I know about all the wrong and done. So if you go to my, um, if you go to the video on mixing vocals, it's exactly the same chain that I use. Um, we're using the whisper, we're using the octave, we're distorting the vocal. Um, it's very, very similar. The vocal thickening trick is down here, and then there is a distorted delay, which is actually a big part of the sound. It's not super loud, but you'll hear it here. Let me turn it up just for effect. So what I do is I distort the delay, then I actually time it back to the vocal. So it's in time with the lead vocal. Um, or if it's a slap, it's very slight. It's a very, very minor slap delay. But I like it because it just adds some uh, around it. And I, I've talked about this before, but it was Jack Douglas that told me about this because what Jack would do with John Lennon's vocal is he would, not on every song, but he did it, they put a crowd noise going, ah, like a huge crowd and they gated it to his vocal. And they put it about that loud. So here's John's vocal and here it is underneath. And the reason why they did that is they just wanted this energy of like, ah, and it's gated, so it's like, ah, ah, ah. And it just adds a little bit of angst because on headphones you just feel like, what is that? Um, so that's kind of, these, a lot of these tricks are my simulations of that by using distortion, distorted delays. You know, I, I'm not, it's rock and roll. I'm not going for the purest, cleanest, pristine jazz recording. I've recorded jazz, I still record jazz, I love it. If I was rec recording and mixing a jazz vocal, it would be a completely different approach to this. Unless I was trying to do something very retro, then I would use like an RCA ribbon mic and I might use a tube pre, which adds distortion. I might try and hit it off the tape machine. You know, but Ultimately, if it's a high quality modern recording of jazz or something like that, we're talking a whole different philosophy. But for rock and roll, I don't mind this distortion. I don't mind um, the wrongness because the wrongness is very right, as you hear me say all the time. Okay, so the last thing that I've neglected to talk about and which is consistent is Steve's Nord electric piano. This is his Herbie Hancockness. So what we've got here is uh, good old lo-fi, which comes free with uh, Pro Tools. I'm sure whatever DAW you're using will have that. The E4, the Mac DSP, bit of high-end boost at 7.5K, just a little bit on the top. And then really our old friend Echo Boy here, without it. Back on. Just. So you can see the mix control is set really, really low. Just some gentle uh, volume rides. Tucking the piano down there to let the... That was letting the saxophone and the guitar speak a little better. Again, you know, we talk about this all the time. Instruments aren't necessarily supposed to be mixed at the same level so they're audible at the same thing at all times. There you see the piano, even though it's playing the lead part and he would have written it on the piano, we're, we're favoring the sax and the electric to play that little riff. Da -da 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 on the part. It's there. You see it's ducked down like three or four dB. Okay, and then last but no means least, is we printed the sax reverb. So I'll do that often. I'll print the reverbs. A lot of mixers will print a lot of effects. When we did the um, second Frey album with Michael Brow, when he was mixing, I noticed that he would um, print all of his mixes 
every version, you know, vocal out, vocal down, you name it, every single thing you could think of. TV mixes, a TV mix is like the backgrounds with the instrumental. And the reason why it's called a TV mix is if uh, you were a singer and you were gonna go onto a TV show, they would play the backing track with the backgrounds and then you just sing the vo lead vocal live. That's what we traditionally would call a TV mix. So you do a TV mix, an instrumental, a vocal up, a vocal down, a main mix, um, maybe pushing up a solo, maybe featuring different instruments. Like try to, try to cover as many bases as possible in his mixes. But then he would also always print his effects on separate tracks. So if it was ever going to recall something, because it's very, very difficult when you're using particularly like analog equipment to recall things exactly the same. Things change so dramatically. When I worked with um, Tom Scott and August Arna, we mixed the record together over at his studio and he had an old Neve RCA console. And he said to me, he don't, didn't do recalls. And when I said, oh, you don't do a recall, he goes, no, I, you know, he does the mix, he sends it to the band, he gets notes and then we work on the notes. But if it, they were going back to like five songs before on the album, he had to be honest with them that there was actually no way on an analog console that isn't controlled by a computer, like an SSL in particular, to get it exactly the same. Now, will you get it 99.9% .9 of the way there? Of course, you know, with good photographs and great notes, it's coming back almost exactly the same. But he was just being honest, it will never come exactly the same because it's not a fully you know, recallable system like a DAW. So with all that being said, that's why guys like Michael Brower and stuff will print analog effects. If they've got, you know, he has a ton. If you see photographs, his, his wall of gear behind him is insane. So he's got all these different reverbs and delays he's using him. He'll print vocal effects tracks, which means when he recalls a mix, he's got them there to use. So it's, and also frankly, when you're mixing, you know, Bob Horn was talking about this. If you watch the Bob Horn video, Bob Horn was talking about how he likes to print things because it's easier for mixing. So if you are using outboard analog gear, go to your reverb if you're using one, print it back in, and then when you come to mix, you can manipulate it like I did. See like all these little, all these little automation points here? There's tons of little automation points and it's so much easier to do on an already printed thing than it, than it is to sort of like change the sends and the returns and all this kind of stuff. Once it's printed, I want to turn it up louder. I can automate it and it will come back the same every single time. The analog piece of equipment quite often, especially tape delays, they just sound different each time, which is great. I love when it's random and it's great within a track to have a random sounding delay. But when you're trying to recall a mix from four years ago and now the tape's worn, the heads are out, whatever, you might get the band going, oh, that doesn't sound like that incredible vocal slap we used to have. So anyway, you get the point. If you can print, I highly recommend it. So that's most of the stuff. Um, the only other things really on this track are there's a double vocal and then there's harmonies going on. And there's quite a lot. So let's go to the end of the second verse and you'll hear what he's doing there. Great, you get the point. It's fantastic, I mean, it's some really good stuff. There's some extra harmonies that come in here. The end. So you got this higher one. And I've got Echo Boy down here. It's a full eighth note delay. The vocal bus has some air boosted on it and some lows taken out of the vocal. When you've got a lot of vocals like that, you see we have three sets of four panned around. When you have that many vocals, you're gonna get a bit of a low buildup. So here, we're rolling off gently. It's a six dB slope, not a 12 dB, at about 193, so around about 200, gently taking it off. And that's just mud in, in the mix that you don't want. You know, it's, 
don't do anything arbitrarily. Don't just cut the lows because you feel like you have to because somebody told you. And then also don't not cut the lows because somebody else told you you shouldn't do that. It's really a case of what do you need to exaggerate? I don't need any super, super lows on the vocals. Now, if I did a 12 dB slope and did like this, that would sound horrible. But if I do a gentle slope, I'm just getting rid of some of the unwanted stuff. I think it's very important to be aware of, you know, the high pass is a good thing with build up because when people want big, loud slamming mixes, which everybody does, one of the biggest things to remember, and I know lots of mastering engineers talk about this all the time, is that the low end takes so much energy in the mix. So if you do have a massive buildup, especially in the low, low mids, like a lot of stuff going on between, say, 150 and 350, if there's a lot of information on there, that's gonna get really, first of all, it sounds really muddy, and it's hard to get any definition on instruments, but most importantly is when you come to master it, you'll never get it to be the way you want it to sound. It's not just about limiting your mix. Um, if you just sit there and keep limiting and limiting and limiting, first of all, you'll destroy all the dynamics in your mix, but most importantly, it will just get louder and muddy sounding. Um, it, you're gonna have to be judicious about how you EQ, be smart about it, but also be aware that, you know, listen, take away the super lows, there's so many instruments that don't need 60 and below that just get in the way of the kick. There's a lot of things that don't need 100 and below, but you don't have to do it as a hard slope, do it as a gentle slope. And I've seen videos where they say don't high pass, but then all they do is they boost all the high information above it. So it's doing the same thing because all you're doing is turning up the signal. So if somebody says to you don't high pass, but then goes to like 200 and turns everything up, which I see that's what they're doing in those videos, is all they're really doing is turning up the signal. So they then turn it down 4 dB because now it's louder, which is the same as sloping off the lows. And it's another reason why, um, depending on what you do, a lot of people say don't boost or don't cut. It really depends on the situation. As you know, with, um, with crystal algae, one of Chris's things is he does a lot of high boost. You know, when I watch him mix on his console, those highs are just boosted across everything. And he's essentially doing the same thing. He's taking the top end and exaggerating it. And then if he has to bring it down in the mix, it's very similar to rolling off some of the lows. However, what he's doing is he's using the SSL sound. He loves the sound of his 4000 with the, I believe it's got the E EQs in it. And what they do is they allow you to have like a, a, they've got a sound. They've got a certain sound that he likes and works really well for him. So that's another thing about EQs is like, be very aware that, you know, it, not all EQs are created equally. Um, so taking a, a, some stock high-end EQs and boosting the top, the high mids and above, it might be better to, if you're just trying to get rid of some of the lows, instead of, you know, getting caught up in that high pass thing, maybe try taking some of the lows off and getting the same thing. You might get the same effect as just boosting, you know, the mids and above. Great, well there's a lot going on in there. Please like check out the track. Um, it's a fantastic song, it's very simple. Um, and uh, the only other thing that comes in at the end is the synth part. Totally 70s. You can tell this guy loves the 70s. It's the Rockford Files. Anybody uh, remember the Rockford Files? Jim Garner? It's a series after Maverick for the older members. Take it out. Put it back in. I love it. So yeah, Steve's very talented. Simple. Uh, great song. Not a lot going on. Oh, I forgot. One thing. The B3, live B3. Pair of 57s on the top, on the vents. So that means they're like this. They're on the vents for the spinning top. And on the bottom, I believe was a D12. Oh, sorry, the bottom is the center here. The bottom is the D12. Now, a lot of people use 320s, RE, sorry. Yeah, RE320s, or RE20s was the original one. So if you have an R, uh, if you have a RE20, you can try that. A D12 works well. It 
the 112 will probably work well. And the only reason why I wouldn't use a large diaphragm condenser is that you're really at the mercy of your Hammond player, because some guys play so loud you might get some distortion. Um, but otherwise, the only other thing that's going on is we've got a room mic on that. It's got a decapitator on it. And a verb to make it even bigger. Here's without it. The decapitator's controlling the high end. So it's just darkening up a little bit. And then the verb is making it bigger still. I talk about that a lot. With really splashy, bright overheads, I'll run a lo-fi on it or a little bit of distortion just to distort the high end first. It's a nice little trick. So all together, that's going through our good old analog channel. We're using that to gently EQ, and then the whole thing has got a lo-fi across it. Take it off. Put it back on. It's just tying it together gluing the whole thing together. Cool, that's the whole track. Thanks ever so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Go to the SoundCloud link below and you'll hear the whole song in its entirety. I really appreciate you watching. As ever, please subscribe. Go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the uh, free trial for the Academy and uh, see if it's for you. There's a whole bunch of additional sessions to download. We do a multi-track every single month. We do a mix critique every Friday, a feedback Friday where I sit there and I talk about the mixes. We have forums. It's only been going a month and we already have a two or 300 people involved. It's fantastic. Thank you ever so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And uh, please come back for more. Have a marvelous time mixing and recording.